so firstly, thanks for coming on, Kevin. Um, it's great to have you. We spoke to some of your former teammates already, Colin Hendry and, and Mark Atkins. Um, but we're going to kick it off with with um, your personal career. You've played hundreds of games. You know, you've represented your country. But what's been, you know, the best moment for you, you know, your career highlight? When you're talking about best moments, you know, I think uh, there's, there's lots making your debut. I mean, my league debut in Scotland against Glasgow Rangers in front of 42,000 people, you know, was was nerve-wracking, uh, to be fair, uh, to say the least. Uh, I probably uh, I was wearing a nappy under my shorts that day <laughs> uh, with the nerves of a little debut to represent your country is something a little bit special as well because um, it's a dream you have as a, uh, a young boy playing football on the street and you hope one day to represent your country and when it happens, you know, and everything comes flooding back and you hope it just doesn't bypass you. And, uh, I think uh, also taking part, uh, even though it was a very, very small part, in, in winning trophies and, and you know, I'd played in cup finals and been beaten cup finals and with runners-up stuff. And then you break a leg and your team is part of the squad, uh, go on and win the league and you, you play a minimal part in it. But it was a, a big, big part. It was if we if I don't score and we don't win that game, uh, we don't win. So realistically, we needed that one. And it's a big, big part to play in it. So for me, it's these are all massive things that you get. <laughs> but I think the biggest one out comes is the dream that I had when I was a child playing in my mum and dad's back garden. And that was a World Cup against Brazil. And we played football in the back garden every single day from a very, very young age. And it was always Scotland beat England in the semi-final. And played for me. Uh, it wasn't in the final, but it was in the finals. But drawing them, uh, when we find out we're playing Brazil in the opening game of the World Cup, you know, the opening game of the World Cup, uh, I get asked the question, what's the biggest crowd you played in front of? And you're talking about four billion people. It's the biggest crowd. It's unbelievable. Uh, you know, I think sometimes the first game of the, the World Cup is, is bigger than the final itself. Uh, but it was just amazing to knew in the first game uh, against Brazil. But for me, that was my childhood dream come true. Just a shame that it wasn't the World Cup final. And we were always beating Brazil, but we didn't this time. And, well, you just touched on that. Well, I spoke to Colin about that Brazil game as well. And, you know, you were playing against the likes of, you know, R9 on the day of Ronaldo. And in the same... You know, um, sort of thing is that you know you you've actually scored against Barcelona, who have had some phenomenal players. But talk me through that goal. Talk me through that day. <laughs> talk you through the day. Oh my God! Uh, you know, we we drew Barcelona in, in the European Cup running, and we were a good side at Dundee United at the time. And you know, I'm a, a twenty year old guy, young lad, just getting and and. Um, against some great players and we drew Brazil, uh, drew Brazil, we drew Barcelona in the quarterfinals and thought, wow, this is unbelievable. We're one of the best teams in the world. Everybody talks about, you know, Terry Venables was there as a manager, an English manager, the Mark Hughes, Gary Lineker. They had uh, a little bit of British contingent in there that, that was an even when it all happened and Everybody's like, oh, Barcelona's going to be a walkover. It's only Dundee United and Barcelona, but Barcelona were going. And uh, the manager basically done his homework, as, as he always does, uh, portrayed it to us. Uh, he didn't make them world superstars. Uh, we knew it was going to be hard, but we had played against teams like that uh, in years gone by. And we had the experience of... of players in there with the, and the youthfulness of some young players to come in and play as well. And fortunately for myself, I got selected for the home match against them in the first leg. And it's always key that if you're at home in the first leg to, to get a couple of goals or, or whatever. Uh, but we knew we were better away from home in Europe. 
so all we needed was maybe a goal and to keep the clean sheet. And we went out and, you know, you always want to do well. But, I mean, whenever we got that opportunity, we were working in the training pitch. And we take a quick throws, we work on throw-ins, we work on set pieces. And fortunately for me, Paul Sturrock had the worst touch in the world for the receiving the throw-in. But the ball came flying back at me. And basically, I just kept my eye on the ball. And I just came back so fast, I just reacted. And it was a, a more reaction than acted, hit the ball. And then I watched the flight of the ball. I watched Zubi Zaretta, uh, the goalkeeper, and he was backpedalling. Uh, it was like treading water backwards. And then I realised it was going over his head and in the net. And, you know, when they, so early in the game, it felt like it was in the 87th minute, but it was actually, I think it was only the fourth minute or so. <laughs> uh, but we still had a, a battle in our hands. You know, Gary Lineker missed an absolute sitter. Mark Hughes missed an opportunity. Uh, Ramon Calderon missed a chance as well. So they had their opportunities to get the sale back in, but they fancied their chances uh, at the new Camp. Uh, but we fancied our chances at the new Camp as well. So uh, it was a very, very catch one. But as I said, the world media wrote us off. But it was part of the story that, you know, competition, cup competition against Barcelona, the only British unbeaten side. And that is a magnificent achievement uh, to hold such a small club. And um, I'm just glad I'm part of it. <laughs> you've, uh, you know, you've scored over 100 club goals, but I mean, it might be that Barcelona one, but if you had to pinpoint one, which has been your favourite or most satisfying from your point of view? Oh, there's loads. I've got loads of crackers. Um, I've got, I mean, I could probably do a, a top 50 of, of good goals. I scored a lot of, fortunately, I got a lot of good goals. You know, I, I've got two against Man United. I always like scoring against Man United. And one against Man United, I got a double, double nutmeg. Uh, and I called one nutmeg on that. Yeah, Schmeichel. So for me, that, that was a good goal. Just because uh, it's the only things you do in the training ground when the ball comes to you. And I think David Batty won the ball in midfield and he made a great pass. And I knew Gary Pallister was close to me and marking me tight. And I've let it go through my legs and it's gone through my legs, it's gone through his legs. I've spun and, and, and ran past Gary Pallister, but my touch is a bit heavy. And, and then Steve Bruce, it's allowed Steve Bruce to come on the cover, try and maybe nick the ball away. But Steve Bruce tried to nick the ball away. I've gone Megs and I've toe poked it through his legs. And then started the, the panic button was getting ready to get pressed because I came one on one with Peter Schmeichel and he just kept growing. The goals were shrinking and he was growing and it was really weird. And literally two seconds to think about it. And I thought, do I take it onto my left and pass it past him? Or do I turn away and flick it over him? And I decided to turn away, go on side on and, and flick it over his shoulder into the net. And it was really weird because I thought, well, he always stood up. He's always spread himself wide. But on that occasion, I knew he was going to go low and I flicked it over him. And it was an unbelievable goal. Uh, and it's just purely because it was one of the best sides in the league at that time, or the best side in England at the time as well. And, it was absolutely fantastic, but you know, I got one against Austria to get us there. Uh, our cameraman at the time, a guy called Brian Henry, was unbelievable. He went behind the goals with his video camera for the game in the hope, obviously, that Scotland would score goals against Austria. And he's behind the goal. And I watched the game back after, I knew it was a good goal at the occasion, but you, you, you knew you hit it well, you knew it was something special. But until I seen it on the TV and you get another different view of it. And, uh, seen it on the TV and it was all right. The goal was all right. But then Brian, he said, I've got, and he was right on the post. So you actually see the ball in the distance that goes away from the goal before it curls back in and hits the post and flies in the top corner. And it was just an amazing one where people look at it and think, scratch their head, because when they watch it on YouTube, uh, it just, well, it's not bad, that goal. But when I see it from the video I've got from Brian, uh, it's amazing. Uh, how wide it went and, and to me it was a spectacular goal but I could talk all day about the goals that, that were spectacular that's the thing and you know as I got a cracker against Arsenal um, they were scoring against top goalkeepers like that uh, it hit my backside and go and I'd still claim it was a top goal <laughs> um, Speaking of goals and you just touched on what you know one of your ones for Scotland 
you scored six in the ninety eight World Cup qualifying games as well. That's that's some achievement. Was would you say that's probably some of like the best form you've had in, in your career? It was actually, yeah. Uh, at national level, you know, people look at my goals at national level, you get nine goals for your country and you play fifty three games. You know, people forget that I probably was on 120 games with Scotland travelling, never played. I was back up to people like Gordon Strachan, people like Ali McCoy, you know, and, and backing them up was just great to be part of, you know. But then when it was my turn to, to become the number one, I didn't really start that campaign. Uh, the campaign uh, started in 97. Well, 96 for the World Cup. I was just getting back. I was trying to recover. I'd been to Euros in 96. I wasn't back, as I would say, to my fitness levels, uh, but I was back to a level that was giving me confidence to get there. But it was that season, uh, Blackburn under Roy Hodgson and Chris, Chris Sutton and myself both hit it off and were scoring goals for fun. We're playing really well for Blackburn. And I carried that on uh, for the national team. I didn't start the campaign. Uh, and sudden, uh, I gets in, scores a goal, and then the manager picks me, and I score again, and he picks me, and, and it just rolled and snowballed, and to get us to the campaign with with six goals for that campaign, and, and it was one of the leaders and goal scorers in Europe at the time as well. So for me, it was that one season was spectacular for me. I just everything I was hitting, uh, score goals. The unfortunate side for me was at Christmas time. Uh, I found out that I needed double hernia and I thought, well, if I go for it now, do I get back fit again for the World Cup or what? But Roy Hodgson was brilliant with it. Uh, we managed it. I didn't really train. I just played in games. And unfortunately, when you go to the World Cup, your national team, you've got to train all the time for the media. Um, but I, I tried to explain that to the management and they wouldn't have it. I had to, they made me train which then meant that when I was starting games and trying to do it, I was probably playing at 70% capacity. Uh, but it was only myself, Colin Hendry, uh, Billy McKinley, uh, Christian Daly, the Blackburn boys that knew that I had this. None of the players for Scotland knew that I was needing a double hernia. Uh, we kept it right under the radar, but unfortunately we haven't to train. That took a, a percentage of my game away. Uh, and unfortunately for me, uh, you know, it was a, not a disappointing World Cup, but I just couldn't add to the tally of the goals it took us there. Uh, I've actually got a few questions on, on injuries just in a minute, but before we go there, the organiser of the charity event that we were ultimately here to talk about, Tony Cartwright, is he, I said to him, is there any questions in particular? Um, and he, he said, what was your favourite shirt number to wear and why? <laughs> well, I've named my business after it. Uh, it's a number eight. Uh, I don't know why. I think it, it basically all started from the Premier League, really. Um, you know, I, I started my career, uh, I think I made my debut, I think it was number seven. I attended to wear it, Dundee United then. Because it wasn't names on the back of the shirt, it wasn't squad numbers, you wore one to 11. So I kind of varied between seven, eight, nine, ten, and 11. So when the, the Premier League started in England uh, and we got squad numbers, Obviously, I wasn't going to get a number nine shot because that was Alan Shearer's. And Gordon Cowens was getting slightly older, who had been wearing a number eight shot for Blackburn. And that's the shot that I fitted into was in there. So uh, Kenny gave me the number eight shot. So, and it obviously, with the Premier League, your name was on the back of the shot. So it was Gallagher eight. So basically, I stuck with that. Uh, unfortunately, when you leave after Blackburn, he didn't have that number eight shirt. Uh, I didn't ask any club for it. But when I started my own soccer school business and things, I just called it G8, the G8 Soccer School, because that was me. And number eight has always been the number that I'd like to wear. And I think Tony, when he first was doing mock-ups of, of this and, and getting ready and trying to get us players and to get ready to join in, probably a year ago now, um, he had me down as a number seven, like so I had to give him a little a little text to say, no, 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 get that number seven away. I want the number eight shirt. So um I'm just hoping now he's he's got it ironed out and got me the number eight shirt. I'll uh, I'll give him a, a reminder if he hasn't it either way. Um we'll we'll go into a bit more on, on that charity game shortly. Uh, but we're just gonna go back to the the injuries and, and that situation and 
you were you you were part of the squad. I mean, you were with Blackburn for a few years, but you were part of the squad in the 94-95 season where they won the Premier League. As you uh, alluded to earlier about injuries, was it a broken leg that kept you out that season? It was, yeah. Uh, totally freak. Uh, it wasn't like someone came and, and had a bad tackle on me. It was a freak accident. It happened at Arsenal uh, at the time. We had a, I remember it was plain as day. It was a clock end at Highbury. And we had a throw in. And I think it was Jeff Kenner was taking a long throw. And <laughs> Alan Shearer flicked the header on. And as he flicked the header on, I've gone, just tried to get in front of Steve Bold, tried to volley it over a crossbar, or, or tried to volley it. And my leg uh, hit his knee as the ball flew past the goal. Uh, and I, I thought it was my shin pad. It, it was a loud crack. And I thought it was my shin pad. Uh, but this is how I know that when you have a bad injury and I laugh at footballers now who roll two and three times because they're not injured because I know when you've got a serious injury you don't move your body goes into shock as mine did uh, my leg I mean I remember the physio my best friend Mike Pettigrew came on uh, the pitch and he was trying to take his time and he said what have you done this is just that the shin pad area, I don't know what I've done. It's really sore and I don't know what it is. And Lee Dixon came up and uh, David Seaman was standing over me and, and Mike was trying to take his time and, and go down the inside of my sock uh, before he had to cut it. And basically, uh, David Seaman came up and Lee Dixon was holding my hand because he could see the pain that I was in. And David Seaman just said, just take the shin pad off and went to grab my shin pad. And as he bent the shin pad, bottom of the shin pad was right on the break and uh, Lee Dixon said I nearly broke his hand <laughs> I squeezed <laughs> it that hard but uh, I can remember that but we got taken Arsenal were brilliant I mean if, to be fair I can't take anything away Gary Llewellyn who was absolutely fantastic the physio and I get taken down uh, into the home dress room and, and they scanned me right away so right away it was revealed uh, the severe fracture of the right leg and uh, it was a bad one, uh, and it was just a case of what did I want to do? Um, and all I thought was, I don't want to be in London when my family's back up in Blackburn. So I just said, look, is there any chance I can go home and then just go to the hospital in the morning? And they gave me a, a, a jab uh, to the backside. That would see me through. And the bus came and picked me up after a match. And I, so I was starting to go into a haze. And I sat at the back of the bus eating fish and chips, playing cards with the lads, got home, uh, got to my bed. And then the next morning I woke up and Mike uh, Pettigrew came to pick me up to take me to the hospital in the back of his car. And uh, that's when I knew that it was severe pain because I had no painkillers. It was wearing off. And every time, because I was lying in my bed with my leg up uh, when it was going down, the pain was horrific. I wouldn't wish it on anybody. Uh, but we got to hospital eventually. And uh, the first operation was four hours. Didn't work. Uh, my leg kept springing out. And they had to pin it. So I had a metal pin in there. And that was it. So it kept me out all of probably 10 months uh, of that season uh, before I go and... Uh, open the wound back up again with another tackle <laughs> it sees me out for the, the rest of the campaign. Was um, Did you break your leg again or was it your other leg that you broke? Oh, it was the same leg, uh, fortunately. Uh, I had the, the, the mind strength to, to believe that I couldn't break my leg again. The surgeon, John Hodgkinson, was fantastic and he got into my head uh, the way that I thought. He knew I was mentally strong. And uh, and the way that I addressed my injury and the way that I rehabbed, he knew that I was, it was the right, correct person to, to go along with. And he just kept saying, you can't break your leg again, you've got a pin in it. He says, you might, you could hurt your bones and that again, but you won't break it because it's pinned, it's secure. And psychologically, that got me tackling, got me doing everything. But then we played Crystal Palace, as I said, um, Jason Wilcox got an injury Kenny called me into the side basically said look can you play in the left wing for us do us a job you know what it is it's a big game uh, 
just give it your best. You're ready for the, the game. And I did, played, and then I scored a goal. And I thought, wow, it was like my debut all over again. Uh, the excitement, uh, the nervous tension that I was having all through. And then when you score the goal, the, the elation that the fans give you, you it's all flooding back again. And all of a sudden, I, and what I teach the children when you do a step over, get away from the defender. Uh, I'd done the step over to get away from a defender and I was as I planted it to get away from a defender he just took my leg out and fortunately and I know it sounds very weird but fortunately it, there was a a blind spot shall I say in the internal part that we didn't know and it shook my leg and normally I was I, I was okay I could get up and walk I was walking on it but I thought this feels like it's buckling a little bit then that's when I realised that uh, we'd done the damage again. And what we found was it was exactly on the brake line. But what it did was it was next to the pin. So it wasn't healing like the rest of my leg, even though it felt like it had healed. So basically it just shuddered it and it came away from the, the pin. So it opened up the gap that it should have and basically uh, helped my leg heal better and stronger. So. Um, that little spell, little cameo role, uh, one game, one goal, one Premier League medal, not a bad ratio. Did you get the actual medal? Because I know now uh, they have uh, the the ruling place. I think you have to play like five games. So did you actually get the medal? I've got the medal. Yeah, I've got the medal. That's uh, brilliant. So, uh, we all, I mean, was, most of us picked the medal up, and Kenny said it's a squad game now. Uh, there should be 25 medals there for that squad and you know David Batty picked up the initial medals and I think Mark Atkins missed out who Mark Atkins played a massive role and David Batty gave his medal to Mark Atkins uh, I don't know whether David got one replaced by the club or what uh, but in general we, we, we picked up a medal from it and uh, I would like to say it's proud and place at home but I've moved a couple of times since then and it's stuck in a box somewhere so uh, I can't even get it out <laughs> um so obviously, in in the end, you know you've come away with that medal, you've come away with that on your record. But I mean, for the most of the season, you were you were sat on the side. But for me, you come across as the type of person to be like, you know, you well. I think everyone at the time at Blackburn was a squad player. We we more of a fan at that point. You know, we had, we were sort of right behind the lads throughout the season. Oh my! Oh yeah! You know, it was it was quite difficult because I was. I mean, um, David Batty got an injury at the same time, and we were training together. So the only time we got uh, to mix and mingle with the lads was basically if we were, at the, we were in the dressing room after we were doing our training and they were there. Uh, so that was really it. Uh, but you were got the games. Kenny involved us in everything, you know. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, Kenny made you part of that squad. You came to the game, in the dressing room, see the lads, wish them all the best, and then get out of the dressing room, go and sit in the stand. So Kenny made you feel part of that. He wanted you to do that. Uh, and that, that was a good thing about it. That's where you felt that little welcome. You know, it's quite easy because Kenny was one of those people like, yeah, you're injured, you're not part of the team. Forget it. He did do that in the playing side of it. But as a person and part of the team, he involved me. Uh, so I still felt involved with the lads. And as I said, it when... I got that call for the Crystal Palace game. It was like making a debut. It was like he just signed me again, and I was making a debut. And and it was really it just it was a really surreal situation that, that it was. But you know, I was just glad he did it at that time. Uh, unfortunately, Jason got the injury, uh, but at least I got to to go in the grass at Ewood and and play again. Just the unfortunate side was that that again uh, seventy minutes or something. I was back in the hospital. <laughs> you just touched on on Kenny a bit then. Um, I know sort of the other lads I've spoken to have got a lot of admiration for him. For you, you've played under under Bobby Robson as well. You know who's been. Obviously, I'm not going to say you know rank them, but for you, who was your personal favourite to play under? They all were. They, I learned something from every single one of them. But I think the special mention has to go to Jim McLean at Dundee United. He was a man that, as a young 16-year-old kid, uh, getting an apprenticeship at Dundee United as a centre midfielder, 
looked at me and thought, too small. Uh, never ever said I was too small, but just thought I was too small to play centre midfield. But he thought, you might be a centre forward, you might be a right winger. That's where you could play. Uh, but I knew that I played like, and the only way I can say it, I played like Frank Lampard as a kid. That's where I played, a centre midfielder who scored all the goals. Uh, so for the age of 16 to 17, I didn't actually play any competitive football matches. I actually studied the game. He asked me to watch uh, a guy called Ralph Millen, uh, who played in the right wing. Another guy, an older player, was Graham Payne. Uh, two different types of right winger. And he asked me to watch them because I could become possibly one of them. And another lad called Paul Sturrock, a centre forward, who he thought that could be another avenue that, that I might be able to do if I put a, a bit of weight on, uh, a bit of physicality, really. So he just waited and it just wasn't happening. So that first year, I never played any competitive football. And then it was just the next year, um, as I said, I was 18. And I was thinking, scratching my head, thinking, I'm 18, I've not really played football. Am I going to be a footballer? A lot of things go through your head. Uh, and my body physically wasn't maturing. Uh, I was still I was still a, what was it, an 18 year old boy and a, and a 16 year old's body. And that was a disappointing thing, for, not for me, but I think just for the outlook when people look at you. Uh, I was in the gym, I was lifting the same weights, if not some heavier than some of the guys who physically look like a man now. And, and it was, and it was just, I was a late developer. And it was just the belief in the manager, the coaching from him, the coaching from his coaches, Walter Smith and Gordon Wallace, Jimmy Bowen. These guys took you aside and they helped you. They took you to give you extra training and the avenue that they were pushing me. So I had to learn my trade all over again. So I had to learn the new position that I didn't play as a kid, but I could play those positions and, and that was it. And to then get that opportunity, I was, it was, as I said, the week after my 19th birthday, or it was a couple of weeks after my 19th birthday, to get that opportunity and go and play in the first team. I'd done it as a teenager, and that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to start as a teenager and go on, and I managed to do it. Uh, but it was very, very close call, hard work, but the belief from the manager at that time was Jim McLean. For me, they were all good. I mean, I wish Sir Bobby Robson was 10, 15 years younger when I worked with him. And I wish I was 10, 15 years younger to have worked with him because he was phenomenal. Uh, unbelievable amount of knowledge in his head. And it was through him really that I got into football coaching and, and understood the game even more. Uh, Kenny then helped by the fact is that when I was injured, he got me basically to study the game a bit more. You know, uh, John Sillett, for example, is how to be a, a players manager, you know, uh, how to get the best out of players. And John Sillett was absolutely brilliant at that. Uh, Bobby Gould, flamboyant guy when he was in, only worked with Bobby on a, a couple of occasions. Uh, didn't really see what Bobby was all about. Uh, Phil Neal, again, just in a caretaker job, only seen Phil for a little while. Uh, Terry Butcher um, came to Coventry at that time as well. And Terry was the one that kind of, I would probably say, uh, kick-started my stardom in England, was changing position and putting me as a centre forward because I'd played against him in Scotland when he played with Glasgow Rangers. And he knew what I was like as a young kid. And when, I came, when he came and became a Coventry manager, one of the first things he did was make me go up front so as a centre forward. And... I never looked back. I was top goal scorer for three seasons. And that, that to me, was what I think tempted Kenny to bring me to, to Blackburn to, to help them out when Alan, unfortunately, got his injury. But everybody I've worked with managerial-wise, they've had something I've had to take back. You know, even my latter years at Preston with David Moyes, for example, how David made some coaching very simple, but it was almost like, for me, it was like coaching children and how it was different that way. Uh, Terry Yorith was a different way of managing when I went to Sheffield Wednesday. I only got to work with him for a month, but again, not much different from what David did anyway. So 
uh, and Mick Wadsworth, who had worked at Newcastle, was at Huddersfield. So I kind of knew how Mick had worked as a coach. It was, it was just interesting to see how he was going to do it as a manager. And the way that he did it as a coach was totally different from a manager. And it kind of, it was it was a little bit different because he didn't really listen to the players when I was at Huddersfield with him. And the system he played, the players didn't like it and didn't enjoy it. And he, he didn't listen that way. And I think that's when he fell on the sword. You touched on that you were, so you played like a Frank Lampard type role in your, you know, very young career. You were a winger and then ultimately a striker. Is it fair to say that as a, you know being a striker was your favourite position in the end? I just love playing. <laughs> if the manager picked me and he said I need you to go and play in the right wing, I just went out and played the best I could. Uh, I wasn't a natural right winger, but guys that had helped me at a young age um, had taught me things, and and I just took that on board. And I tried them, and they worked. And because I was quick, uh, it looked like you could be a winger. Uh, I just I like to be in the hustle bustle of it all. I like to go on the ball and pass it, move, get on the ball, go for a dribble, make runs, drag people away. I, I love to do all that. So I just love, love to be in the heart of things. And as some people said, you, you need to stop sometimes. And it's something I had to learn was you stand still at times. Was, was good in football. But I just like to be on the move all the time. I didn't... I knew that I had a physical problem, that I wasn't as big as a lot of the defenders. So I wasn't going to shield it off them all the time. So I had to be on the side of them. I had to be on the front foot all the time if I was going to get the better of them. And that's all part of learning the game and, and getting taught from good people. And it did. And, and it gave me good football knowledge. And that I think that's what helped me because just as a kid at 16 and younger, you know, a centre midfielder just breaking forward. So I was always on the ball, passing it wide, getting into the forwards' feet, getting the back, shooting the goals, running past the centre forward. I was doing that naturally. So even though I wasn't really a centre forward, and today's game is the younger ones that, that ever see these, it's like playing a number 10 role. But we played that in the 80s and the 90s. We did play a number 10. It's just slightly different to the way they play it today. And in the charity game, uh... Are you bothered where you're playing or have you, have you also hinted to, to Tony whereabouts you want to be involved? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to sit on the bench for 85 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Five minutes I'm no, I think, yeah, no, I mean, I think now you're getting, you, I mean, I enjoy it. I like to go out, I like to do these charity things and it helps and it's for a great cause, you know. Lenny John Rose, you know, spoke to Lenny lots of times. And then, unfortunately, when he got struck down with MND, it, it's, wow, it's, it's an eye-opener for everybody. Um, and to see it, and to see the way Lenny's uh, sort of gone sort of backwards now, uh, it's, it's quite hard to take when you know what he was like as a person, you know what he was like as a football player. And, and we want to support what Lenny was, uh, you know, uh, for the future. And if it can help other people, people from this it'd be fantastic and that's that's the idea I think that, that Tony wanted to put this together for and it's it's a great thing and it's one of those that you just couldn't turn down you know so no matter if my legs can't move you just wanted to go and make a as you said even it's a five minute cameo ten minute cameo I might end up playing 45 minutes it's just one of those you just want to be there be part of it um, and, and represent it because it's for a magnificent cause you just touched on there, Len, obviously the, the days about him. It's his side that you're playing in. Um, how So how well do you know Len? Was it um, in his sort of younger career? He didn't, he didn't have a sort of massive career at Blackburn because he spent time at Burnley, Bury and, and Preston. How, how well do you know Len? No, it was more aftermath, uh, more on Len's retirement. Uh, and after it, it kind of, it's kind of weird because sometimes, even though Lenny played in the 80s and then he moved on to different clubs and things, after it, we have our former players at Blackburn Rovers, and through the former player stuff, uh, we're always trying to keep in touch with people like Len from day, days gone by, because it's always nice to try and, and get them back to the football club and have a nice little chat. And we've got, I mean, Kevin Lynch was doing the, the boxes at, at Blackburn Rovers at the time and get people back to, to do talks and have a chat with the fans. It's nice for the fans to see what former players are about and, and how they're still going. and and that's the side of it. And, you know, a great friend of mine, Andy Bayes for BBC Radio Lancashire, uh, got involved with Lenny and 
obviously because I work with Andy and knowing we're, as we say, we, we say the ant and deck of BBC Lanks, uh, we, we then, uh, Andy went away and he's helping Len and it's only true right that Andy can use his contacts and, and all of us, if we are able and willing, then we'll go and try and help out as much as we can. And and that's when, as I said, when, when Tony got the, the call, we'd be, be available to do it. I got myself fit nice and ready. I'd have probably lasted an hour. Uh, unfortunately, the COVID situation is, is taking its toll from it all. And uh, I put a few pounds on them, starting to lose them. So, because I know the game's getting closer. And fingers crossed, uh, we can have supporters at the game. And uh, as I said, it, it would just it'd be a fantastic day. Hopefully, the, the sun shines and, on everybody. Definitely, that's a great place to end. July 18th is what, it, what it's all about. It's going to be a great game, whether it's five, ten minutes or 45. I'm sure you'll, uh, yeah, you'll be involved. Time doesn't matter. And it's uh, it's taking part, getting involved in it, you know. And uh, as I said, we'll all enjoy it. It'd be nice to, to reminisce with some of the other guys, you know, and, and mixing lock and horns with some of the Burnley boys, some of the Blackpool boys, you know. And it's it, we have a football community, that's the thing. And, it doesn't matter what club you played for, what uh, rivalry you had, uh, everybody will be together on the day and, and will enjoy it.